Oh, I forgot. I forgot. Um, three, oh, nine. Count your blessings.
And uh, so there was uh, a situation where they went into this country and Abimelech took Sarah to be one of his wives. And uh, God, God didn't want anything to happen in this situation. So God had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech. And, and then it was the prophet brought the information to Abimelech and told him, look, this is the way it is. That you're, you, you're in this situation you're in because of Sarah. And so it all came to light and there was an understanding they came to and the children of Israel were allowed to go anywhere they wanted in Abimelech's kingdom and live where they wanted to. One of the things that I just wanted to touch on, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I just wanted to touch on, was in this Old Testament setting, we see that there were some very stringent standards amongst the children of Israel anyway, about husbands and wives. And uh, it, was, it, it was kind of a standard that was amongst the children of Israel. Do you know what that standard was? Do you remember what that standard was? For the, for the men of Israel. Well, they were only supposed to marry people that were of their, of, of their own kindred. But this is really not a legal standard. This is a spiritual standard. God did not want the children of Israel intermarrying with people of other beliefs and other faiths that worshiped other gods. And if, if we go back and we remember some of the things that Rita taught us in, in that particular portion of Scripture, we know that there, there, there were a lot of problems caused in the kingdom of Israel because they didn't follow this standard. But I want you to see, it goes all the way back to Abraham. This was not something new that just came up. God, God holds these things very, very, very sacred. And this is just one of the places where we see it. Wasn't Joseph the first one that married outside of the nation of Israel? Well, I, 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 Jacob's son, Joseph, that went to Egypt. Well, did Moses have an Ethiopian wife? Yes, he did. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think, I, I, I just don't, folks, I just can't remember the details like I used to. I have to go back and look everything up. You know, I, I spend I spend more time preparing for every message and every class than I ever have before. Cain took a wife. Mm -hmm. Well, too. Who? Before Abraham. Oh, that before Abraham. Yeah. So, so, so yes, but uh, that 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 was mentioned though, and, and you're right. Then uh, the next verse we want to look at is Exodus 21, Exodus 21, 18 and 19. And if men strive together, and one smite another with a stone, or with his fist, and he die not, but keepeth his bed. I, got I didn't get my page sequence right here, just a second. If he rise again, and walk abroad on his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time, and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. Now, this was a law, a Jewish law, that was handed down, and it was, there were remedies to it. Uh, God said, if, if you injure somebody with a stone, you get in a fight with them, you injure them with a stone, or even with your fist, and, and they can't work, even though they rise up and, and they're recovering, but if they can't work, you have to pick up and take care of their finances until they're fully recovered. And, uh, and, and the word it used here is thoroughly healed. Now, if you take the time to read all these, they, this is an extensive listing here. and It covers so many things. But this is the only one where it talks about a person being healed from an injury that was caused by anger. But God covered that too. But now we're going to jump down into Leviticus, and we're going to look in chapter 13 of Leviticus. And I have uh, one, two, three, four, four. I have four references in Leviticus 
that I, I just put, I just pulled these out of the context that they were in because these are all there's so many listings in Leviticus about how a person with leprosy is declared clean and the process they have to go through to be back in amongst the people. So uh, we're going to look at uh, primarily in these Leviticus ones, it's going to be the word healed again that we've used before. Leviticus 13 and 18. The flesh also in which, even in the skin thereof, was a boil and is healed. This is a part of the process of what the priest had to look for before a person could be declared a clean again. Then 1337, Leviticus 13:37. But if the skull, and skull here means scab, be in the in his sight at the stay, in other words, it's not it's it's not changing any, and that there be black hair grown up therein, the skull is healed. He is clean, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. Now, I didn't pull all the scriptures out around this, but one of the key things that was looked for by the priest in the cleaning of these people, the period of clean, I mean, he was, was the hair that was growing in the affected area white or was it black? And if it was white, they had a different problem. Now let's go into chapter 14, verse 3, Leviticus 14 and 3. And the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the lepers, leper, <laughs> they separated the leprous people out away from everyone else outside the camp. And the priest had to actually go to the location where the pe people were. If, if somebody was calling out saying, I'm healed, I'm healthy, I need to get back in amongst the people and with my family. But, but the plague, leprosy, leprosy here is called a plague. And the, the meaning of the word plague here denotes that it was contagious. That it was contagious. Now, I didn't take the time this time to go in and look and see uh, all of the different references about uh, this word plague and how leprosy could or could not be uh, contagious. And, and, I, and I don't remember. But this is the way they looked at it. They looked at it as a contagious plague that could be spread from one person to another. Now, for the most part, leprosy in our day is almost, has been almost eliminated, but not completely. There are still cases of leprosy that show up on the earth, and uh, there's uh, there, there's a lot of uh, oh negative connotation to the uh, areas where where leprosy is still brought up and still comes uh, is there to be treated. But the one thing we do know that leprosy today can be treated. Leprosy today can be healed by medical science. Uh, so if if uh, if we try to spiritualize, or maybe I should say over spiritualize the things about leprosy and 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 say that it's a curse from God, which you know a lot of the early writers, uh, commentaries and stuff talk about leprosy being a curse from God put on the people. I haven't been able to find scriptural evidence that it's a curse from God. But let's go into 1448. This is the last one in, the, in Leviticus. And if the priest shall come in and look upon it, and behold, the plague hath not spread in the house, after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean, because the plague is healed. Uh, the whole responsibility of pronouncing a person healed or clean fell on the priest. And so the priest had to go into places 
And I guess the reason I'm, I'm thinking along these lines is, is, is I'm thinking about, you know, there are times when I go into places where there's things that my, may or may not be contagious. And, uh, but I'm, I'm called in to pray for people. Sometimes I've gone into situations where we didn't even know what was wrong. We were just called in to pray, so we, did. we found out later what was wrong. But uh, it's, uh, so I kind of I kind of understand. Can you imagine what it was like for the priest in those days? Because in their day, there was nothing worse than leprosy that, that man knew about. That's that scripture you just read is about the leprosy being in the walls and in the home and yeah. you know, the, whatever their homes were built with. So leprosy was a serious, serious plague. And, and but we know that it could be overcome because the priest could, and even Jesus sent the leper back to show himself to the priest to follow the Levitical law. And, 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 right. and when we take that connection between what Jesus did and how Jesus treated the lepers and, and how Jesus, you know, I will be thou clean. He, you know, he said that to, to the leprosy, to the lepers, and 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 it's 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 pretty important for us to realize that uh, these men had an element of faith that they had to live with to obey God's direction for their responsibility as a priesthood. But doesn't that tie the priest and them? Ministering to the lepers, doesn't that tie to the gifts of the Spirit, healings and the gifts of the Spirit? I, I, I mean, maybe not directly, but indirectly. I'm not saying that, that the priest healed them, because then it was God that they asked, they had more open communication with God. That's the only way I know how to say that. And I didn't want to get bogged down in, in, in Leviticus, but you're, you're right, because... There, there was a whole process about every level, how they handled their, their, their clothes, how they handled their homes, how they handled their animals, how they handled their family. It was, it was, it's all in there in, in Leviticus, but it's just, it, listen folks, it, mm -hmm. I don't want to say it's boring, but it is. And, and, it's, and it's so lengthy, it just goes over, well it just goes over and over and over and over those things that, and, uh, and, and for, for the sake of what we're doing here, I wanted you to see that the Old Testament had directives and had instructions about people being healed. Yes. And that God has always been interested in healing our bodies and, 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 and touching us. So now we want to jump into Numbers chapter 12. All the way to Numbers chapter 12. Yeah, on that, on that other... Uh, to me, it's pretty interesting how they went and figured out just exactly what had to be done. And it was all it, it was all through the priesthood. And and so a little commercial here, okay. We know that the priests served in the temple or the tabernacle in that time, but later in the temple. And these laws didn't change when they moved into the temple. And I know that the temple is a type of the church. And God is showing us here. I know it's a little bit uh, of, a, a, of an idea to think, but God is showing us that he always planned for the church to be the vessel that he moved through to bring all of his truths to the people. And that gives us uh, great privilege in the church, but it also gives us great responsibility in the church. Now, Numbers 12, verse 13. Uh, we're talking about Moses. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. Uh, Aaron and Miriam had begun to... Uh, well, belittle Moses over the situation of his Ethiopian wife. Now, as they were causing some discord in the in the camp and in, in, in the in the children of God, God called the three of them, Moses and Miriam and Aaron, to the to the tabernacle, and there. God 
uh, chastised Aaron and Miriam. But Miriam was found to be covered instantly with leprosy. Now, this is where some of the writers will say to you that this leprosy, God, that God put this leprosy on Miriam to teach her a lesson. And so when we hear about people going through things and we hear statements about God did this to teach him a lesson or God did to show him something or to use him as an example, it's from scriptures like this that some of those things do appear. And, and they come up. Uh, but notice right away that Moses prays and cries out to the Lord so that Miriam doesn't stay in this situation. And for seven days, Miriam was placed outside the camp, and after seven days, she was pronounced clean and allowed back into the camp. So you can see, and I can see, where a lot of these people that talk about things coming on people to teach them a lesson or to use them exam, you can see where they have a credible source for that kind of thinking. <laughs> Go ahead, it's fine. Okay, it says, and the anger in my life, this one minute, I was trying to look it up in the King James, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed, and the cloud left from the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And the cloud was a symbol of God's presence. I don't think it would have happened had the Shekinah glory of God remained over her. So I still believe it was the enemy of her soul. Well, well <laughs> and, and so let's let's take. You, you, you're just, you know, you're right on schedule, Rita. You, you're right on schedule because I want to liken this cloud, God's Shekinah glory, His presence being lifted from the tabernacle. I want to liken that under the hedge that was around Job that was lifted exactly. where Satan was allowed to go in because I'm never going to change my mind. Mm -hmm. All sickness, disease, and infirmity is from Satan. Yes. And it's the result of sin. So what... It says it in the King James stages. I, yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> what, what was Miriam's and Aaron's sin in this matter? They spoke against... His servant, Moses, disrespect. It was disrespect. There could have been some jealousy involved here. Well, we could probably just go through the Ten Commandments. And exactly. We could probably find elements of most of the Ten Commandments here. Yes. But the way you said that, it might sound to some like anyone who gets a sickness has sinned, therefore they have a sickness. And that's not always the case. Exactly. Thank you for reminding me that because we always want to, we all, we don't ever want to connect every sickness to sin. Right. We know that we know the root of it is from the sin of the garden. That's better said. The root the of, it of the earth is when when the earth was cursed, and and so we we we, we, we want to be safe there. This Thank you. That Satan just took an opportunity. You know, I taught that book about the, the atmosphere we create. Well, if, if we, whether we're doing anything sinful or not, if we create an atmosphere of sin around us, meaning we uh, participate, meaning we don't speak up for the Lord or we speak against God's servant, the enemy uses that. It's not that God's doing it to us. The enemy uses that. Every, Whether we're in sin or not in sin, the enemy uses every opportunity of weakness to draw us away from God. And sickness is one of the... So, so when I was laying up in the hospital, I, I kept asking God why. And God didn't answer me immediately. I went through months and months and now years of, of, of difficulty. And even to this day, I am still fighting the, the, the physical difficulties that came into my life through this. And I don't think God answered me right away. 
because I don't think I was mature enough. I don't think I was ready to handle the answer. See, I, I've always been real quick to, to, be, to find the source of you know, who to blame, what sin to blame. Uh, I, 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 and some of you that have been with me a long, long time know that I, I have very carefully pointed out how that smoking and what it can cause to your body and drinking and what it can cause to your body and a lot of different things like that. I've, got, I, I've really gone into a lot of detail about that. So I'm laying there in bed and I've got a, a, a stopped up heart and I'm asking God over and over and over and over. Uh, you know, I was exposed the first 15 years of my life. I was exposed to continual 24 hour around the clock smokers in a very, very smoke filled environment. And uh, so I was looking at, well, is some of this uh, a, a result? People who are smokers have more instances of heart problems than non-smokers. That's just a statistical thing, but it's there. And it's the same with alcohol, and it's the, the results of alcohol. And then, then there's the diabetes part that comes in there. There's all these factors. But see, we learn all this stuff about the effects from medical science, not the Word of God. And so I'm laying there thinking that, well, I'm, I'm blaming this, and I'm blaming that, I'm blaming this. And then the Lord, when I was ready, revealed it to me that I had been unwise and uncareful in my choice of food. And not only that my choice of food, but the volumes of food. I, 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 I just, I don't know why I can't explain this to you. God hasn't explained it to me yet, but for as far back as I can remember, I've been an overeater. And, and, and just too, too much food. And, and, <laughs> and I, believe that, I believe that to be what God showed me was the source of my heart problems. Had nothing to do with sin except for, and you know, some people say, well, that's the sin of gluttony. Well, you go and you look at this, you look at what gluttony is. Gluttony is when you eat to the point to where you have to throw up and then continue eating. So I've never been that. I've been near it, but I've never been there. But I've been sick a lot. And it's been, it is possible to relate that to my eating habits and my dietary habits and things like that. And that's, that satisfied me. That's the answer that satisfied me. You know, before you start talking about this, I was thinking, the reason I'm getting my immune system down, I guess because I've been living on not entirely popcorn, pickles, and mm -hmm. trying to lose weight. <clears throat> yeah, and it's probably got my, and I'm getting a cold. And so, some, 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 sometimes our immune system can be touched by these things. Uh, I think the enemy looks for any. That's where I was headed. Thing. Thank you. Any little thing, any little yeah. You probably ate over eight as an adult because you were. We just talked about it when I got here. You were so skinny growing up, you know, and then you hit that whatever age it is that all of us hit, and it, it doesn't fall off like it used to. And But I think, I still believe that the enemy, maybe we do things that are not really sin, but we, things, Satan will use anything against us. I've asked that same question. I'm facing something that I thought was done. And I asked, I asked, I said the same thing Monday. I said, I've served the Lord. I've taught His Word. I've been a testimony of trial. I've not been perfect. And I said, I don't, you know, because the first thing that God dressed me was, have you ever been a smoker? No. And do you drink? No. <laughs> you know? But, then I, you know, and He gave me some Bible. And, thank God, He gave me some, was able to give me some Bible. And then, you know, he said, we can't explain why it happens. 
to a pastor or a teacher or a precious daughter. We can't explain it. We just know that, you know, I've just decided that God is just picking on me because I won't stop. <laughs> and not God, the devil. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the devil is picking on me because I won't stop. No matter what he does to me, I will not stop. I, I, I have been on that same level of thought over the last at least two and a half or three years about get out of the ministry, retire, let some younger guy do this, somebody that doesn't have all the problems you have, and and. The, there, there, there is a myriad of reasons. There's a mountain of reasons that nobody knows anything about. But, but, the, but, but the truth of it is, is I believe that there is a blessing coming to the kingdom of God. And even though I don't feel adequate or think I'm adequate, I believe God is going to use me more in my last years than he's used me in all my former years at it together. But I will not stop. In that our ages... If we stop, then we're, there's already a struggle to getting the next generation to stay hooked. If we quit, what happens to the church? And that's exactly that's exactly what we're talking about. I know about. Laura's working, but for that generation, but if but if we as if we as late sixties and seventy somethings, if we quit, what happens to God's kingdom? And I'm not saying there's not workers out there, but it seems to me there's getting to be fewer and fewer that will truly stay with this. And I think you're right. And I think that's that's one of the reasons that Satan is trying to use everything he can to get to us. Well, from somebody from a younger generation, just to kind of jump in there, like you said, if y'all quit, not only does it affect the generation below me, but then whenever I come call, who do I call? Because right now it's her. <laughs> well, and, and I believe that's why we need the generations together. And and there's actually two other generations between the ones that were represented here tonight that are that are in dire states because uh, my children and my grandchildren and 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 it's a uh, it, it, it's 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 it is a war. It's a war. And. Uh, I can't tell you that I haven't been quite discouraged in, over a lot of things lately, but I have not been discouraged about Elm Grove. I've not been discouraged about the ministry that's going forth from Elm Grove. I've certainly not been discouraged about the missions ministry that's going forth from this place. And I've had more of my minister friends speak to me and tell me they've seen something on Facebook, they've seen something on YouTube, and it, it's it's... I, I think I made a comment to Nancy yesterday that more people are in, exposed to the ministry of Elm Grove right now than ever before in the history of this church. And, uh, and, and all, all the statements that I get back, I, 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 I haven't got one of those negative, acidy, hurtful things. I just haven't got one of those in a long time. And it's, it's been very, very, very encouraging. Let's, uh, we're, we're doing pretty good on time tonight. Let's go down now into Deuteronomy. I hear a motor running somewhere, but I don't know what it is. I think it's probably here in the freezer because I do that all the time. Okay, okay. Thank it, you. it makes a humming noise. I, I've gone so That's what I'm hearing. That, that's, that's probably, <laughs> thank you for that explanation. You're welcome. I have to know the source of every word sound because. Usually some weird sounding something's about to break and I need to fix it. <laughs> Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. Verse 39. See how that I, even I, am he. And there is no God with me. I kill and I make a lot. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. God is declaring to humanity here, to his children, the difference between who he is and who all these pagan gods around them are. Uh, God is sovereign. 
There, there are no other gods. Why do you tell us in the Commandments, don't have any other gods before me? Don't, don't, don't put these other gods. When, when Moses came down from the mountain and the children of Israel made their golden calf, uh, you know, it, it, it was God's anger was 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 revealed there. Man has a tendency, always has had a tendency, to find something to worship, find something to give his life meaning. Uh, so many times, I I stop and think. Uh, if Bill Sanders is gone tomorrow, is there going to be any anything left to, sh to, to prove that I was even here? And these these thoughts come up. Uh, one of one of my one of my minister friends uh, refers so often to this thing called legacy. What's your legacy? That's something that you leave behind. And uh, as a human being, we think about things like this. But really, we shouldn't. We really shouldn't. Uh, especially those of us in the ministry. Because I'm not, and, and this is how I remind I'm not doing this so that Bill Sanders can have a legacy. I'm doing this to build the kingdom of God. I'm doing this, doing my little part, in something that's bigger and grander and greater and and the very fact that God says he's going to give me a place to live with him and he, that that that's the legacy that we need to have you know you've heard me tease about it I, I'm going to I'm going to spend the first period of time while I'm up there I'm just running around saying I made it I made it I made it I made it because of of all the self-doubt that comes along uh, I, I'm, I'm sure I will be, and I'm, I'm sure I'm just making these statements to make a point. But at the same time, uh, you know, this particular portion of Deuteronomy is actually a song that Moses wrote and sang to the people. He taught the people through music. Now, I, I, I can't imagine taking the... 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy and say, okay, let's all sing the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy tonight for worship. But there was a method in his madness. Haven't you ever noticed how you can remember parts of a song better than anything else? E even advertisers know that they put music and they put words, songs with their advertising and you'll remember the advertising better. Catchy jingles, Catchy jingles and things like that. Well, it all started with Moses. Moses was was a song a songwriter, and much of his and, and, and we were sharing this last week with Scott is that the the writings of Deuteronomy are in themselves lyrical. If you go in there, you can find a rhythm. Now, it's not a rhythm like we would put in a modern song, but it is very much. A, 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 a rhythm that was used in Psalms. So where did David get his Psalms? It had his thought for writing something. He got it from Moses. It was a part of their worship. And uh, so I like that. Now let's jump from, from Deuteronomy into Joshua 5. Joshua 5. Verse 8. And it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. Remember, as they came into the promised land, they said, okay, we're going to make sure that every one of the children of Israel, the men of the children of Israel, are circumcised. And so, this, this was a nationwide situation, but it teaches us some things about how God intends for us to be whole or healed before we resume our normal activities. 
uh, recovery to God is very important. It is. There's not anything it's not important with. Uh, the process in today, uh, a lot of us have, have had the experience where we have a time of extended therapy after a surgery or after uh, uh, an accident. And this is a part of our healing process. And we're, we're, we're actually supposed to, God is showing us here, you need to take this as just as important in your healing process as anything else. I know you know, when you, you mentioned the, the surgeries and stuff, and, and so they concentrate on that particular thing and you do the extra exercise and stuff to strengthen it. Well, when we get weak, in God's Word, then we need to start having some therapy and we need to just make ourselves start Glory. digging in because that's where we get stronger. Hey Ron, I think you got something for your next sermon right here, brother. <laughs> that'd be that'd be delicious. Um, speaking of sermons, you know, I'm I'm about halfway through my sermon for Sunday and I, I'm getting real excited but I'm I'm running out of paper. I, I literally, I, I, I had to go rob a few pages of paper. Got some in here. I, I need to get some paper because I'm just running out of paper in my house. It's just, it's flowing. And I, it, it's one, I'm so excited I want to get here and I want to do it, but I want it to be in God's time, God, because, man, I'm finding so many good things about the spirit of Christmas. And, oh, it's just, it's delicious. Uh, and it's there. God wants us to recover when we have sickness, disease, or infirmity. And this scripture says he wants you to do the recovery before you resume your normal activities. We have a lot of folks affiliated with this assembly that are in the processes or different levels of recovery from many, many things. And we need to encourage them that this is a part of God's plan for healing them. And let them know that they're not letting us down by going through the steps of recovery. Taking the time off. <clears throat> moving away from certain activities so that they can be and, 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 and being involved in the special activities that are necessary. Um, my, my, one of, one of my uh, recent minor situations was with this skin cancer that was removed off of, off of my right arm. It turns out that this was a, uh, a much, much larger spot. You know, on the surface, it only looked like it was a, a, a little small uh, boo-boo. But underneath, there, there were actually inches in each direction all the way around it of, of, in, of, of, this, of this skin cancer. Uh, now, it wasn't one of those that's uh, malignant, so we don't have to worry about that. But it, it's one that could become malignant. It could go to the next stage and become malignant. But uh, as I had to follow that doctor's uh, recovery style. And, and, and his nurses and everybody told me, don't let this happen to the, to the wound. And don't let, don't do this. You know, uh, I had to cover it up with waterproof bandages so that I could shower and a whole lot of things like that. And, you know, it, it, to me, it seemed like nuisance. It just seemed like a nuisance. But when I go back, got my stitches out, the doctor said, oh, this is, you have healed beautifully. Well, I had to think, well, I, I obeyed you, so maybe that's why it's, it's worked out so good. Because there's been some other times when I didn't heal so beautifully, but I didn't follow all the things that I was told to do. Recovery is important. I think I want to get one more scripture, bit of scripture in tonight, and from the book of Job, the fifth chapter. And I want to use 17, 18, 19, and 20. Job 5. And I've, I've got a lot more scripture 
In, in, in fact, in the next two weeks here, I, I honestly plan on completing this study uh, next Wednesday. I plan on using it next Wednesday. Our holiday is Sunday, and I don't know about you, but I'm going to be back to normal by Wednesday, so that's why I decided we just go ahead and have Bible study. Uh, I, I, I just decided to. Uh, I've had several people ask me if we were going to have anything. Uh, but we are. And I hope to finish these Old Testament things. But in the next few pages, I've got a whole lot of scripture around it because I, I don't want to get just the fact that someone's been healed. I want to get the lifestyle. I want to get the circumstance. I want to get the blessing of everything around him. And that's, that's why I'm using these four verses in Job. Verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God corrected. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. For he maketh sore and bindeth up. He woundeth and his hands make whole. He shall deliver the in six troubles, yea, in seven, there shall no evil touch thee. In famine, he shall redeem thee from death. And then my, my printer quit, so I don't have the rest of that verse. In war from the power of the sword. Okay. And, and uh, uh, so, so I, I, I missed that little part. Uh, I'm glad that the scripture here shows us how that God does have a process of correcting us. How does God correct us in New Testament times? Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to our mind. He speaks to our heart. And, and there's, there's a, another level of that. How does God correct it? Through the Spirit, but in the Word, with the Word. God, if God is correcting you, if it's not just uh, your honorary pastor trying to correct you or something like that, God will use the Holy Spirit, but God will use His Word. The Word is the foundation of God's correction to us. He will speak to us from the Word. I, 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 I can't, so often, the Lord just illuminates something to me in the Word of God. And today, when I was printing all this out and, and, and compiling it and putting it together, this, this part about God's hands, how, you know, we, we sing that song, Hand in Hand with Jesus, and that Word, it, his hands make whole. I was sitting there in my study today and I was singing to myself, He touched me. Oh, He touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. I was just, I, I was just thinking, God's hand makes me whole. Yeah. And, and God cares about everything in our life. He cares about when we're afraid of something. You know, there's there's just so many things lately that I've been worried about how it's going to work out. I've been worried about how what's going to develop from this. Where, 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 where is this all going to end up? And over and over, I just say, say Lord, I'm just going to hold on. I'm just going to hold on to your hand. And, and I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you, Lord. No matter how this story kind of unfolds, no matter, and I have been told so many things, and I mean going back all the way to, to, to my whole life, I've been told stories about my life, people in my life, that I cannot, I just cannot believe these things. But they, these, these stories keep coming and they keep coming and they keep coming. And, and I have to say, well, Lord, if so-and-so told me this and it's true, does that change who I am? 
It doesn't change who I am. It does give me some concern because, you know, when, when, when you find out that something is a certain way 50 years after the fact, and you've always believed it to be another way, I've had to... My, and and, and, and I, I'm going to kind of put this in. A lot of things from my past, I mean, even prior to finding salvation, I'm finding out from others that it was just a bunch of lies. The, the reason we did this, or the reason we did it, was, that wasn't the reason we did it at all. My folks made changes. My family, my dad's extended family made changes. My mom's family made changes. And, and I thought, well, this, is, this was the answer that I had. Why we did this? Why? Well, come to find out now, according to what I'm hearing now, and wasn't none of that stuff true. <laughs> Not either. We've been talking about the Pharisees and they're, they're putting oral tradition equal to the Torah. Yes. You know, the, the Word and God's law. And we've talked a lot the last few weeks about that oral tradition what people told you when you were a child or told me when I was a child is maybe so you wouldn't be bothered by it or be burdened by it. So they just told you any old thing to get you to go away. Yes. And that oral, that's what that oral tradition does. It gets twisted and turned based on someone's like opinion or view or not wanting to tell you everything right now. So your whole, then when you get... To be 70, your whole world is... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like somebody just put everything in a in a gunny sack and shook it up real good and then poured it all back out. So, okay, that's your real life. That's who you really are. Well, anyway. God, and praise God, your real life is since you were redeemed by the blood. And that's just it. I've had, I've had to go back to that very thing. You know, okay, so what if this is true? I've been born again. And I've, I've gone another direction. Now, I can say that some of the decisions that I've made since I've been a Christian were based on what I learned back then. But, now that I'm here, I'm just being real careful and being cautious and going to the Lord, Lord, should I really get up this morning? <laughs> I, I want to be in the center of your will, Lord. I want to be in the center of your will. You know, so nice and warm. Oh, Sister Nancy. Sister Nancy put some flannel sheets on our bed yesterday. And an extra quilt. And an extra quilt. And I, I haven't slept so sound. I mean, I, did, I didn't even look up this morning until a quarter to eight. And, and that's, that, that is way, way, way late for me. But I, I take, I did, I lay there for a minute, and I just said, I don't want to get it. <laughs> but I knew I, I knew I had to work, I knew I had to work on this, and so I went ahead and done. Thank you everybody for watching. I just want to remind you, if you want to, Sister Nancy will have a, this whole meeting. She's filming right over there, and she'll put that on YouTube in the next day or so, and do what? And Facebook, it'll be on, on Facebook. So anything that you might have missed on this uh, upside down uh, situation, might it'll be taken care of there. And thank you, God bless you for supporting us and encouraging. You're being here encourages more than we can say.